These stories are tales that have once been on the channel and have been removed by myself for one reason or another. I feel it's time to give them a second life. Welcome to the archives. I'm a sleepwalker. I've woken up on the floor, in the hedges outside, and half hanging out of the refrigerator with orange juice spilled down the front of my shirt, just to name a few. Most of the time it would end in uncontrollable laughter from my two roommates, and thankfully over time my embarrassment wore off. Last fall, however, that all changed. My roommates and I attended college in a fairly rural Midwest area, so the nightlife consists mostly of house parties and bonfires and cornfields. One Saturday night, my roommates and I were driving down a gravel road to a family farm of a friend when our high beams hit something about 200 yards down the road on our side. It looked like someone walking, so we thought maybe a fellow partygoer had some vehicular troubles, though we hadn't seen any abandoned vehicles on the way in. We turned off the high beams and as we got closer, we saw that it was a red-haired girl in a white dress that almost matched the fairness of her skin. I was in the passenger seat, so I rolled down the window and stuck my head out as Thomas slowed the car. Hey, do you need a ride? I tried to call out in the friendliest voice possible to alleviate any fears that may be caused by a car full of guys approaching a girl by herself in the woods. As Thomas continued slowing down the car, I could hear the gravel crunching underneath us and eventually we came to a halt. The girl stopped walking and turned toward us. She looked at me and smiled, a sweet but knowing expression that matched the mild humor I saw in her bright green eyes. She was very pretty, her hair a deep shade of shining dark red against her flawless pale skin. I'm fine, thank you. I just like to walk, she said, sounding distant but very sure of herself. Are you sure? It's pretty dark out here and no telling what's in the woods. Dave chimed in from the back seat. Her eyes darted quickly to the source of the question, and she issued a firm, I can take care of myself, and began walking again. All right exhaled Thomas. I guess we'll see her when she gets there. So I said a quick, see you later, rolled the window back up, and we rolled slowly past the girl and down the road. The party was pretty fun that night, but for some reason I couldn't get that girl out of my head. I kept looking around, trying to make sure she had made it safely, but I never saw her. I asked others at the party if they passed her on the way in, but no one recalled seeing any pedestrians outside of the town. There was something about her that I just found intriguing. Maybe even a little unsettling, but I attributed the latter to our remote location and fearing for the girl's safety. Dave suggested that maybe she lived around there and was just going for a stroll. But the only residence within 15 miles of that place was another farm that had been abandoned for over 50 years, so I wasn't convinced. Eventually, the party died down and we got ready to leave. I hadn't been in much of a drinking mood, so I was sober to drive the three of us home. We piled in the car, Thomas and me in the front, and Dave sprawled out in the back on the brink of unconsciousness. Several folks had left earlier to go out to the bar in town, so once again, we found ourselves alone on the gravel road with the darkness so black it seemed solid surrounding anything our high beams and taillights didn't touch. About three miles from the party, and another four or five miles from the road into town that connects to the gravel road, we spotted something on the ground beside the road ahead of us. At first, we thought someone had tossed a white bag of trash out their window to avoid the dumpster fees, but as we neared, we saw what it actually was, the red-haired girl. Thomas let out an appropriate, 
What the fuck? And I nodded in agreement. She seemed to be sitting with her knees pulled to her chest and her head tucked into her arms, which were folded on top of her legs. My stomach immediately sank when I realized it was her. I knew we should have picked her up. She'd probably been sitting there the whole time, scared and alone. I figured that was why my gut was not letting me forget about this person. She didn't raise her head or look up at all as we pulled up beside her, and Thomas rolled his window down. Hey, sweetheart, you okay? Thomas asked through his open window. No response. Hey, can you hear me? Can we please take you somewhere safe? Before Thomas could even finish enunciating the word safe, I heard him make a horrible, guttural sound like he was choking on his words, and he frantically began scrambling to get away from the window. As he began struggling, I saw the girl pass him for a split second, and she still appeared not to have budged since we first spotted her. Finally, Thomas caught his breath and screamed, Go, 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 go! and began rolling his window up. His tone genuinely freaked me out even though I hadn't seen or heard anything. So I took off and we didn't look back until we hit the road that would lead us into town. What the hell just happened back there? I asked him. I'm pretty sure Dave slept through the whole thing. Mike, I swear to fucking God, Thomas began, still gasping for breath. She looked up at me and her goddamn eyes were black. I could hear her talking in my fucking head, dude. What the fuck? Wait, what? What the hell are you talking about? She didn't look up the whole time, and I didn't hear anything. I was starting to get uneasy, but this sounded like a crazy drunk guy rambling. Oh my fucking god. No, dude. She looked right at me, and I could hear her saying over and over, I'm what's in the woods. I'm what's in the woods but her lips weren't moving at all he was getting me pretty good at this point i'll be honest i felt like a ping pong ball was stuck in my throat i couldn't believe dave was still passed out and i had no idea what was going on i know that girl seems strange but this seems something like out of a horror movie nothing like that happens to real people right no not right not at all we finally made it home but not without looking in the side and rear view mirrors more than we looked ahead we managed to wake dave up and get him in the house even through thomas's hysteria once we threw dave on the bed i went in my room to start getting ready for bed i was scared as shit but it was so surreal I don't think I even processed it that night. I was just happy to be at home where I was safe. I talked to Thomas for a while and managed to calm him down enough to go to sleep and I promised him we would talk about it more in the morning when we had the chance to recover from everything. Well, the morning never came for Thomas. I laid in my bed for a while, wondering what was really going on with that girl, if she was in fact a girl, and if Thomas had really experienced what he said he had. I honestly had no idea what to believe. I tossed and turned for a while, a little jumpier than usual. Eventually, I turned on some late night cartoons and was able to fade into sleep. I didn't dream at all. It seemed like I was asleep for a split second before I woke again. I awoke in complete darkness, thick like the darkness in the woods. Although it was pitch black at first, I knew I was not in my room. I was on my back on a hard floor. Oh fuck, I thought. I've been sleepwalking again. This room had a strong smell. Not a particularly bad smell, just a strong smell of wood and insulation and mustiness. Like an old, unfinished room. I could tell the floor was made of wood, 
not concrete, so I knew I wasn't in the basement. I was in the attic. Immediately, I wondered how in the world I had managed, in my sleep, to push up the attic door panel in my closet ceiling and hoist myself in there. Slowly, I realized the faint, pale light from the TV in my bedroom was sneaking through the open attic door and casting a flickering blue glow over the attic, causing the thick blackness to retreat ever so slightly. That wasn't the only thing I realized. I wasn't alone. When the TV lent its brighter flashes to the attic, I saw her. Her? I don't even know anymore. I saw it. I saw the white dress, the pale skin, the red hair. Although it looked a little different now. And it was standing in the far corner of the attic near the exposed trusses maybe 30 feet away from me. Its face looked very different, but I couldn't see it very well. I would say that it was the scariest moment of my life, but it paled in comparison to what happened next. It was as if the second I saw it, it saw me. Its left foot slid out first, making no sound as it moved. Then, it crouched down in a squat and slowly lowered its left hand to the floor and began to walk. Not crawl. On all fours. Toward me. Frozen in fear and still lying on my back, I glanced toward the open attic door. I thought for a second that I might be able to make it to the door, but as I was trying to gather my courage, the TV turned off and I was back in the dark. With a sinking feeling, I tried to be brave and tell myself this was just a dream I was waking up from. Well, that didn't last long. As soon as I turned my face back toward the thing approaching me, the TV flickered back on. The girl, this thing, it was staring at me, maybe six inches from my face. Its skin was still white as snow, but grotesque-looking blue veins bulged beneath its surface. Its forehead and eyes were unnaturally large and completely black, just as Thomas had said. I noticed its fiery hair looked different, and then realized its hair wasn't red at all. It was blonde and almost completely saturated with blood. I could see the blood running down its forehead, into its black eyes and around the two holes where its nose should have been. The worst part was the mouth. Its thin lips curled back from pointed yellow teeth in a hideous grin that seemed to fade into the darkness on each side and never end. It was the horrific, unmoving visage. I was staring at as the words, I'm what's in the woods, rang over and over in my head in a voice that seemed to belong to something incredibly old and unfathomably evil. Even though the screaming was all in my head, it felt as though my eardrums were about to burst. Over and over, I heard this phrase. I'm what's in the woods, shrieked at me from the wheezing, nearly motionless monster that was before me. It seemed to consume me, the TV light fading out until I saw nothing but the grinning face of that creature. This is the last thing I remember. I'm safe now. Thomas and Dave burned with the house, but somehow... I made it outside where I woke up. Almost everyone assumes I was sleepwalking and was already outside when the fire started. But I know what happened. Please don't believe me, but I know. I told them what happened, and I guess that's why I'm here now. Maybe they kind of think I did it. <laughs> Who knows? 
Seems the only thing they could prove was that I'm a lunatic. I don't mind. The strong leather straps keep me in my bed at night. No worrying about where I'll wake up or what I'll do. I just go to sleep in my bed and wake up in my bed. I used to sometimes see the creature in my dreams, but they're giving me something for that now. It's not so bad. I just get a little tired sometimes. Well, I might try to get some rest now. I went camping about three weekends ago in the Huntsville National Forest in Texas. Me and three friends that came home for the weekend. They are all in college and usually we all get together at least once a year, old friends from high school. For the camping trip, we planned to go backpacking deep into the forest, live off of fish that we catch and animals that we can trap. We have been doing this for a while in Texas and in numerous places, Arizona, Colorado, um, New Mexico. So. We're pretty much used to anything you'd encounter out there. It was my turn to pick where we went camping, so I chose Huntsville. More accurately, it's Huntsville slash New Waverly. So we drove up there, park our car in a camping park spot, and start walking off into the forest. We had some laughs along the way, everyone catching up with each other's lives. We walked until it started to get dark and set up camp where we stopped. Everyone gathered wood to make a fire, and we set our tent up. And we do what we always do. Try and scare each other with weird stories. Around this time, we started to smell something very faint. It was noticeable, but not overbearing. We couldn't put our finger on what it was, so we just carried on. Mike had to go piss, and he walked off into the forest. A second later, he came running back, piss all down his jeans like he'd missed really bad. Immediately, we all crack up and throw some jokes at him. Then, we noticed that he was white as snow and trying to catch his breath. He starts screaming for us to follow him and runs off. We all get serious and go follow him, not knowing what the problem was. We start to hear a faint scream and crying in the distance, in the direction we were running. It was pitch black away from the camp and Mike had the only flashlight. We left ours at the camp. He had his from his trip taking a piss. So at this stage, we didn't have much choice but to follow the light, which was frantically pointing here and there in front of him. The scream gets closer and Mike starts to slow down when we notice a ratty old cabin that looked like it was abandoned, except for a faint light that we could see from one of the old mildew covered windows. The crying was intense. Whoever it was couldn't breathe enough to let out a full yell. We all followed Mike up to the front door, and we could all hear the crying from inside. As soon as he knocked on the door, the crying stopped. We all waited and heard really heavy footsteps walking fast to the door. There was a giant slam against the door, and the sound of a bolt unlocking. Then, nothing. We waited for a bit, knocked a few more times, but still nothing happened. We walked around the house, and there was no fucking way any of us were leaving each other aside, and noticed the window, which was a good way up. Alex took a deep breath and asked us to give him a boost so he could see inside. 
Me and Mike lifted him to the window. We watched him brush away dirt and webs from the window and place his face close to the window to try to see something. There was a quick beat. Then suddenly, he breathed in fast and let out a loud scream. Then he fell back from the window, screaming bloody murder the whole way. We all tried to calm him down, but he was hysterical. We went to him, but he started to shake, punch, kick, cuss, you name it. And then he took off towards the camp. None of us wanted to be separated, so we all ran close behind him. We caught up to him and grabbed him and set him down. The fire was dying out, so I grabbed some nearby wood that we collected and added it to the fire. My hands were shaking and I had to do something. I went back to Alex and we all tried to calm him down. He couldn't. He wouldn't. He kept screaming and was breathing so hard that he eventually fainted. All of us were terrified now and we all kept the fire high until sunrise. Periodically, Alex kept waking up, screaming just like before. By sunrise, he was up and looked catatonic, just mumbling to himself and whimpering. Mike and I decided to go look at the cabin now. It was daylight. We searched where we thought it was, except there was nothing there, nothing at all. The indistinct smell from last night had now grown into a very strong smell of something dead, something stale. We headed back to the camping site. When we got there, we found Alex had chewed into the sides of his face and swallowed so much blood that he was throwing up. John was at his back and he looked like he was about to die from exhaustion. I guess we all look that way. I just didn't notice until I saw his face. Alex said quietly that we need to leave. Now. We all started to pack up the tent. It started to rain really heavily. and It was about noon and the sky started to grow really dark. Alex started to go into a panic. He went and grabbed a large stick and yelled at us to leave it and leave now or he'd knock us out and drag us out there himself. Mike started to yell at them and they eventually started to fight. We broke it up and finished packing and then started to make our way back. After a little while, we arrived at a creek we had crossed the previous day. Only it was flooded over and the water was moving too fast for us to cross it. Alex started to scream again, yelling at Mike for taking his time packing up the tent when we could have gotten out of here. This went on for a little while until we finally convinced Alex to calm down and tell us what the hell happened. He said, as soon as he put his face to the glass, a face on the other side did the same thing and started to smile really big. It had dark eyes and a dark mouth which was much bigger than Alex's. As the smile got as large as it could, a giant shadow behind it swung something down and sliced its face off. The face was stuck to the window and he said it started to laugh quietly as it slid down. Mike still pissed off and though he wouldn't admit it, beginning to get freaked out, started to argue with him again. We eventually started to follow the creek for a way to cross. We then started to see toys floating in the creek, really old toys, old Barbie dolls and baby dolls. This wasn't like any trash floating in the creek though. It was a lot of Barbies, a lot of baby dolls. One washed toward the side and Mike picked it up. It had some kind of voice chip that was dying and starting to say some gurgling words we couldn't understand, followed by its sad excuse for laughter. Then it sounded like it was whispering. 
We thought the batteries must be dying. He threw it down. We kept going and the sun was starting to set. Alex was freaking out more now and was whimpering and breathing heavily. We all started to see shadows move behind the trees. Something. We all call BS on until we all were seeing it. It was barely light out and we stop as we see the cabin right in front of us. None of us knows what to think. Mike says, this is bullshit. I'm going in there. Alex tries to stop him. We all do. All of us just wanted to go home. Mike says to all of us to fuck off, do our own thing. He doesn't care anymore. This is all bull. We started to hear hundreds of the same sort of baby doll as before, laughing, whispering, and trying to sing. We start to move forward, past the cabin, all of us, and kept pushing forward. We smelled something dead in the air, something stale, the same thing, the same something as before. We started to hear something crying and something screaming. We kept going on and eventually crossed the creek and left the woods. We get back to our vehicle and got in. It's pitch black and we drive. We're about to get on the 45 to Houston, but the road is under construction and can't be accessed. It points to a detour. As we head towards the detour, it seems to be a small, bumpy dirt road going into the woods. Eventually, while we're on the road for a while, we see a young girl come up to us. She looks like she was in trouble, young and pretty. She approaches the passenger side door and she looks like she's really drugged up or beaten up, I couldn't tell. Alex doesn't roll down the windows nor does he open the door. He reaches for the handle and immediately locks it. She puts her face on the window and starts to smile really big. We floor it. Alex starts to cry and scream and we're all breathing heavily. We finally get on the street that takes us to the 45 and we take it the whole way. When we get back to my apartment, everyone doesn't know what to say and we all break apart and go our separate ways. Mike messages me later and says he's going to go back. And I try to convince him not to and all he does is say it was our own minds that were screwing with us. I think he just went to prove to himself he wasn't scared. I can smell that stench everywhere now. I don't go out anymore. I just stay in and don't answer the door. Last week, everyone I met was acting really strange. People that I knew for a long time and total strangers. My own dad. When I went to his place to eat supper with him, he just watched me, strangely, when I was sitting down. He didn't say a word the whole entire time. And I kept asking him, what's wrong? And he just slowly shook his head. When I was leaving to go home, I turned to wave. He had black eyes and an open mouth, like he was in pain. When I started to walk back, he shut the door and bolted it. I stayed there knocking and knocking, nothing. I called him. His phone was disconnected. I even called the police. Halfway through the questions they were asking me, the connection started to fade into static. I could hear a faint mumbling, singing, and laughter. Mike has completely vanished. There's not even a record of him being alive. When I call Alex's house, they talk to me like I'm some salesman. They say they don't know any Alex and to please stop calling. The person who tells me that is Alex's mother. I can't get a hold of John. Someone knocked on my door and when I went to look, 
I saw a face completely covering the peephole, and a giant smile started to form. I called the cops again, and instead of it turning into static, they got really strange. Sir, are you affected by any drugs at the moment? No. Are you coming home anytime soon? Excuse me? Come home. And the phone call ended. My mail slot swings every now and then. Someone is sliding pieces of baby dolls through it. I try to call people now and all I can hear is static and bad baby doll noises and this crying and screaming. My TV is busted, but when I go to piss, I could hear it on. I might be going insane. Whoever lives above me started to scream in pain and crying deeply recently. I hear giant footsteps from their apartment. I hear bangs and something falling to the ground. From the neighbors to the right of my apartment, I hear what sounds like a baby that never gets tended to, and then it sounds like a baby doll whose batteries are dying. My phone has been ringing now, and it's Alex telling me things in a language that I've never heard of before, nor could even manage to repeat. I kept getting emails of pictures of black and small colorations. Now, I can't even access my email. Someone knocks on the door, and they slam against it. I hear the bolts unlocking one by one, and I run to make sure to lock all of them back. Then, I sit down and begin to cry. Our trip started in late February as my three friends, John, Steve, Max, and I, drove in my truck deep into the backwoods of Boxwood Gulch to follow the North Fork of the South Platte River. Steve owns a cabin up in the backcountry, so we left my truck there and began our 57 mile hike into the wooded terrain following the river. We had all our camping and fishing gear packed and enough food to hopefully last us the three day journey both ways. As we first set out in the early morning, a few light snowflakes began to fall. The terrain was heavily wooded and uneven, making for slow going. The cool mountain air rustled through the trees and the sunlight streamed through the canopy, making the snowflakes glint and shimmer as birds chirped overhead and the river babbled in the distance. It was going to be a near perfect trip. We stopped for a quick rest a few hours in. The weather had been slowly worsening since we had left, but it was only then that we realized how bad it had gotten. The snow was whipping around us in a blinding flurry as the wind howled, making the trees creak and sway, almost threatening to snap in two. The ground had already accumulated a good six inches of snow. It was about midday, but the sky was black. And I don't mean dark due to ever intensifying storm. I mean that in between the gaps in the clouds, there was no blue, just solid black. None of us really made note at the time as it was hard to notice through the thick cascade of snow and the limited visibility. After continuing our hike for some time, however, it became all too apparent that something was wrong. In addition to the sky, we also realized that there was nothing absolutely nothing in the distance. There should have been some mountains or something like there had been at the start, but no matter which way we turned, the world only seemed to extend 50 or so feet around us. Then it disappeared into the blizzard. It was nighttime now, or at least it was dark out, but it was two in the afternoon. As we walked forward, new things slowly came into view, but everything behind us disappeared and Although we could progress further, we couldn't seem to double back. Once we'd left something behind us, 
We couldn't reach it again. Steve had forgotten his lighter a little while back when we stopped to eat, but when we tried to turn around and go back, we were greeted by a wall of snow and a fog impossible to see through. Our flashlight's beams didn't penetrate the fog. They stopped as they hit it, as if it was a physical wall. Curious, Steve reached out and moved his hand into the fog. First his fingertips and then his whole hand disappeared into the haze. We all stood in disbelief looking at the wall which was impossibly tall and extended as far as we could see. There was no real gradient to it. Things didn't fade into the distance. There was a clear line where the wall began but nothing was visible beyond that point. We're making a note of this when Steve muttered something. What was that? I asked. I, I can't feel my hand. He said slowly, as if realizing it as he had said it. Puzzled, he retracted his hand slowly and then screamed. His glove was shredded, almost disintegrated, and his hand looked like it had been forced through a wood chipper. Deep gashes revealed white bone underneath and what fingers were left were stripped clean. We all panicked. Oh God, oh God, this is bad, Max cried. Steve simply stood clutching what was left of his hand and hyperventilating. We had to get him to a hospital where he would certainly bleed to death, but we were almost a day's walk from Steve's cabin, which was already remote enough. We were all frantically checking our phones for a signal when the worst happened. Steve fainted. His eyes closed, his legs buckled, and he fell forward into the fog. None of us noticed that first, but when we finally did, all we could see were his legs protruding from the mist. We immediately, without thinking, rushed to pull him out. We grabbed his legs and strained to drag him back into view. Before we even saw him, however, we immediately regretted doing so. We somehow knew what we would find. The thing we dragged out was not Steve, not anymore. All of his skin was cleaved off, his rib cage ripped open with his entrails spilling out in his face. Jeez, it haunts me to this day. Not merely because it was horrendously mutilated, not merely because his eyes had been torn out leaving only empty sockets, but because it smiled at me, a big, wide smile that started small, but the gashes in his face allowed it to literally stretch from ear to ear. Max screamed and shoved Steve's mangled body back into the fog. We ran as fast as we could, the only way we could, deeper into the woods. Just as before, the snow and fog parted before us, but swallowed up everything we left behind. As we ran and ran, the scenery around us began to slowly change. The trees surrounding us were now withered and dead. The grass was flattened and bleached. In fact, everything around us was dead. Colors had all but disappeared, leaving only shades of gray and an intensified feeling of loneliness and death. While we ran, I realized something. Guys, I shouted. While I ran, not daring to stop for even a moment, we can't turn around and go straight back, but maybe we could circle around back to Steve's cabin. Then we could get the truck and get the hell out of here. John and Max nodded their head and we turned 90 degrees right and continued running. Eventually ran through what appeared to be a herd of deer, all of which were laying on the ground, gray and lifeless, hacked to pieces, blood soaked the ground. As we ran through the herd, dodging corpses, it was hard not to notice that their dead, lifeless eyes seemed to follow us. When we felt confident enough that we wouldn't be doubling back on ourselves, we turned towards Steve's cabin, towards safety, towards safety. We ran for at least another hour. Eventually, however, none of us could run any longer. Our bodies simply wouldn't allow it, and we were forced to stop. After some time, Max, John, and I managed to get a fire going, despite the snow and damp tinder. We had hoped that it would bring some sense of warmth and security, but we were wrong. The flames were a bright orange hue, bleeding some color into the gray scale world. It clearly did not belong, nor did we. 
The longer the flames cracked and popped, the more we began to hear something. Distant and quiet at first, but slowly growing closer, louder, more numerous. A chorus of blood-curdling wails and moans soon filled the air around us. Focused on the fire and pretending to be safe, mesmerized by its beauty, we didn't immediately notice a mangled deer carcass slowly dragging itself out of the fog and into view. Nor did we notice the second, nor the third. Finally, we snapped out of our trance just in time to scramble to our feet in terror as a myriad of different animal carcasses climbed out of the fog, drawn to the strange light of the fire. We were intruders in their world. I was paralyzed by fear, unable to breathe. I turned to my friends to find that they were no longer beside me. They had taken off running, leaving me behind. I turned around to run after them, but something grabbed me by the shoulder. I didn't need to turn around to know what it was, I could tell by the hand gripping my shoulder. A hand that looked like it had gone through a wood chipper. I flailed and managed to free myself before it could get a good grip on me, and I took off running. I didn't look back, no way did I want to see that face of what was once my friend. I could no longer see John or Max, and I assumed that they would have been ahead of me. but. I was the only one with the keys to the truck and Steve had the keys to the cabin. They wouldn't be any safer if I couldn't meet up with them, so I ran and ran faster and for longer than any human could possibly do under normal circumstances. Finally, after God knows how long, I could finally make out a structure in the distance. It was the cabin. I felt a twinge of hope. The wails continued to ring out in the night air but I seemed to have a lead on them at the time. I reached the truck, unlocked it, and jumped inside. I scanned the area for Max or John, but could see neither. I couldn't just leave them, but I couldn't wait here forever either. I sat sweating and shaking nervously as the wails grew closer and louder. I had just about made up my mind to leave when I could suddenly make out someone sprinting toward me. It looked like Max. I started up the truck and motioned for him to run faster, but for some reason, I found myself subconsciously pressing the lock button, locking all the doors. My instinct told me that something was wrong. I looked down at my hands, and they were shaking like crazy. I looked back up, and Max's horribly mutilated face was pressed up against the driver's window, staring at me, smiling. He was trying to open the door. I slammed my foot on the gas and drove off, shaking like a madman and holding back the vomit. As I drove home, the sky slowly brightened back up to a blue hue, and I could eventually see the sun breaking through the clouds. It was nine in the morning. I began to see other cars on the road, and the people inside waved at me as I waved at them. Nice, normal people. I went straight home and asked my girlfriend to marry me. Eh, just kidding. I'm sitting in my house right now, door locked and barricaded, windows boarded up and I'm writing this story. And I felt happy for the first time in a long time writing that ending. But that's not how it ended. I merely wish it had worked out like that. The truth is, as I drove, the sky did not brighten up, the sun did not reappear, and the fog still surrounded me as it now surrounds my house. I hear wailing all around and knocks at my door constantly. And when I look through the peephole, all I ever see is some thing smiling at me. The stench of death is everywhere. The phone doesn't work, and the TV and radio broadcast nothing but static. And I hear the locks on my door being undone at night, and I must constantly keep watch and relock them. I'm simply waiting for the night to get into my house when I forget to check the door, or when they break through a window or when I wake up in the middle of the night to see them next to me, their smiles inches away from my face.
I've talked about my road trip on this board before. Sick to death, working myself to death. I took the first vacation of my life last year. A beat up, rebuilt Yamaha Zuma in a foolish sense of optimism carried me across the western United States on an adventure that seriously made me rethink everything I thought I knew about the world. I loved Seattle with the hip original hippie neighborhoods and the perma carnival atmosphere of Pike Place Market. The bridge troll was a highlight. Gotta love a city that sees a bridge and goes, you know what this needs? A giant concrete troll. Getting out of Seattle, however, that was a total nightmare. Restricted to back roads by a motor that capped at 40 miles an hour. I must have gotten lost a dozen times despite all the help I received from baffled gas station attendants. So I was behind schedule when it came to finding my campsite. Some miles south and a little east of the city there's a free campground. It's most often used by horse riders and boy can you smell it. That's actually what guided me in the last few miles. There's a gravel road off a service road and then a few crooked unpaved paths off that. The trail markers were all bent, broken, or faded. In the end, I had to follow my nose. I set up my junior scout tent in the fading twilight. Mine was the only one there. I had the place all to myself. After a quick meal of apples pilfered from a previous campground, I did my usual travel log spiel to my video camera by lantern light before turning in. I'm not sure how long I slept. I know I checked the time, but I'll be damned if I can recall what it was. Something had disturbed my well-earned beauty rest, but I was too groggy to remember what it had been. I sat in a stupor, too alert to fall back asleep, but too sleepy to be totally awake. And then something brushed the side of my tent, and suddenly, I was more awake than I'd ever been. I had done plenty of camping by that point. I was familiar with the sounds of the usual nighttime critters, from raccoons to coyotes. Nothing had ever bothered me in my tent before, just snuffled around the camp before wandering off and leaving me be. From the sound of the footsteps, it was walking on two legs, and that was my first. My mind immediately jumped to the worst possible conclusion. Bear. There's a lot of conflicting information out there about how to deal with bears and a lot of it depends on what type of bear. Sitting there in the dark with my heart beating in my throat, I had no way of telling which species I was dealing with. Shout out or play dead. I was 30 yards from a sturdy cement block outhouse that might be better shelter. As quietly as I dared, I slipped my boots on and got ready to dash. The tent zipper seemed impossibly loud in the night as I worked it open centimeter by centimeter. I moved agonizingly, slowly. Once outside, I craned my neck around to see if the bear, if that's in fact what it was, was between me and the outhouse. With the incredible illumination of the Milky Way, I could see the campground clearly all the way to the tree line. There was nothing out there. Although, I could feel something watching me. It was like feeling an insect crawl along the back of my neck. There was no logical way for me to know something had its eyes on me, but out there in the dark, in the middle of nowhere, all alone, I couldn't dismiss it. Still, on high alert, I crept along and tried not to crunch the gravel under my feet too loudly. The outhouse was still my best bet. The door was propped open by a stone, but inside there was a heavy duty bolt lock. I would have to spend the night surrounded by the smell of not only horse, but also man poop. But I figured that was a fair trade for not getting mauled or eaten. My hand was on the latch when I heard the awful crunch of footsteps and gravel behind me. I kicked the stone propping the door open out of the way and slammed the heavy metal door shut, no longer caring how much noise I made. Whatever it was on the other side had thumbs. Something tugged on the door as I struggled to bolt it shut. I won, but it was close. There was a metal mesh along the top of the structure for ventilation. Through it, I heard the bellows of heavy breathing that matched my own. My phone was back in my tent. 
because, well, I'm an idiot. There was no way to tell time. The same stupid impulse that brought me out there in the first place kicked in. I had to know. Hello? Silence. Maybe they hadn't heard me and then... Hello. I could have shit myself. I was in the right place for it. The voice was feminine, like my own, and the sound of it was a kick to the gut. I couldn't even tell you why it made me so uneasy. The sensation was like when you're walking upstairs and you're expecting another step, but your foot comes down on an empty space. I'm sorry, I thought I was alone, I said. I'm alone. Every syllable was jarring. I'm sorry I freaked out. I didn't think there was anyone else here. Sorry, I'm here. You'd think now that I knew it was another camper, I would have opened the door, but I never did. Some deeply buried instinct kept me from taking my hand off the bolt. You scared the crap out of me. Are there more tent sites out in the trees or something? I'm something. There are more. Her words made me sick to my stomach. Again, I couldn't have even told you why, only that they did. From her odd syntax, I guess English wasn't her first language. Do you need to go? Use the bathroom, I mean. Because I'm going to be in here for a while. And that wasn't a lie. I wouldn't have opened that door if it was my own mother on the other side. You need to go. Her grasp of English was improving with every sentence. There was something weird about it. Look, I'm sorry if I scared you, but you started it by creeping around in the dark. I won't come out. Can you go somewhere else? I'll be gone in the morning, I promise. I just wanted to sleep in peace. You need to be gone. I promise you I creep in the dark. You won't be here in the morning. Fear cemented my mouth shut. The more I spoke, the more she did, and I didn't want to hear her voice anymore. I'm sure that makes me sound like a bigot or something, but I had the feeling I was feeding words to her, and the feeling was not pleasant. It felt like she was hungry for them. The same instinct that told me to keep quiet the first time kept me from running my dumb mouth off again. I was either dealing with someone who was not mentally well, or was something else entirely. There was a threat in her words, or the way she spoke them, and I had no doubt she would be able to carry out that threat. I kept my hands on the bolt while they cramped, and the first rays of sun crept sluggishly through the mesh at the top of the walls of my shelter. It wasn't until the sun was strong enough to make me sweat in my self-imposed prison that I felt brave or stupid even no oh, anyway enough to speak again hello are you still out there hello anyone there was no answer which was the best outcome i could hope for i opened the door my tent was untouched at least from a distance the oppressive feeling of being watched had dissipated i dressed and broke down camp in record time my moped cranked to life but it wasn't until i went to put my helmet on that I saw the footprint. I'd kicked that rock pretty far. It was close to my bike. Naturally, I went over to it. I had to know. In a clear outline of fresh mud, there was a single print on the smooth gray of the stone. Not human, but a hoof, like that of an unshod horse or goat. It was so fresh, so vivid. It hadn't been there last night when I used the bathroom before I'd gone to bed. In the soft mud in front of the outhouse door, there are more of the same, some of them on top of my own boot prints. If you want to go looking for whatever the hell it was, be my guest. Just be careful with your words out there, because I figured out what was wrong with that voice when I watched the playback of my travel log video. It was my own. For the last 35 years, a lake in northern Canada has been the site of hundreds of suspected drownings. The location is in the middle of the Canadian tundra. There is nothing around, no food, no shelter, just cold, inhospitable wilderness. The lake is frozen eight months out of the year. Nothing happens then, but during the thaw, when we're doing our flyovers, 
we'll see clothes floating on the surface of the water. Like we've always done, we'll dispatch a team to investigate. They'll bring back whatever they can recover, which will invariably be clothing in someone's wallet or purse. So far, we've never recovered a single body. Had the lake been deep or veined with labyrinth subterranean caves, we wouldn't think twice about not being able to recover a body. Same if the lake was full of fish who were big enough to eat and digest the body. But the lake's 40 feet deep at its deepest point. It's crystal clear. We could see the bottom from our helicopter just as clearly as a boater can from its surface. Our watch post has turned into an international notification service for missing people. The Canadian government granted us the authority, along with the equipment, to research and contact anyone who might be familiar with the owners of the forms of identification. Each time contact is made, we learn the person had been reported missing. There doesn't appear to be any time limit on how long a person has to be missing before their clothing and IDs are found floating. Some can be missing for days, others for years. Any personal effects we'd recover then get sent back to the families or loved ones. While the situation is bizarre, we've never lost much sleep over it. It's all too surreal. Without any bodies or signs of violence, it's easy to brush the darkest aspects of it aside. But this past spring, after the thaw and during the new recoveries, different reports started coming in. Indigenous people within a 300 mile range have started showing up in hospitals. Unexplained burns have been found on their skin. Further, the cancer rate among the indigenous population has risen by 400%. I haven't been alone in noticing the new, bluish lights seen reflecting off low-hanging clouds. I had a hunch one night, and had our helicopter pilot fly us in the direction of the lake. Like I had expected, the flashes of blue against the clouds intensified as we got closer. Upon our arrival at the site, hovering approximately a hundred feet above the lake, blue light would shine at irregular intervals from the bottom. The pilot, a former American military engineer, said it looked like Chernikov radiation. That alone wouldn't be enough for me to write this. Unexplained natural phenomena is a fact of life. It seems like the more remote you are, the more inexplicable things you'll encounter. The floating clothes concern me, but don't frighten me. The flashing light fascinates me but doesn't disturb me. But there's one last thing. A geological expedition recently finished a typographical study of the surrounding area for an unrelated purpose. Their data, like all state research, was made available to us. Being moderately interested in geology and geological formations, I gave it a look. Something caught my eye. I went to our database of the photographs we'd taken of the personal effects we'd recovered from the lake. I was looking for ID photos. Before long, I found what I was looking for. I checked it against the geological data I've seen. Not really believing what I was looking at, I checked again with another ID photo. Same thing. For 500 miles around the lake where people disappear, the topographical readouts show the vague but unmistakable shapes of the faces of the missing people. And the faces are clearly screaming. I made the ultimate mistake in buying my first house, trusting someone else's judgment before my own. My fiance to be, who picked the location, a semi-rural backing onto an Australian bush reserve, and the house itself, 
old and dilapidated, but in his words, with a lot of character. Convincing me he knew an investment and a bargain when he saw one. We had our whole future mapped out, and I was happy to just nod and agree with him. So, I signed the paperwork and paid the deposit on our future marital home. And then a week after it was all finalized, he broke off the engagement. I was down one fiance and up one property that I hated and was barely habitable. I had paid the entire deposit and he was going to start using his savings to start the renovations right away. After the initial relationship mourning period, I went into a fuck him action mode and moved into the house. I had bought along with all the tools and equipment my dad would let me borrow, along with a patchwork knowledge of DIY renovation projects from Google. I wanted to get the place up to scratch and sell it for a profit so I could build a property somewhere I actually wanted to live. My first night, I slept badly, old sheets and a mattress on the floor, waking up sweating at every rustle outside. I'd never lived anywhere but the city before, and the sound of living creatures pushing through the undergrowth, snorts and animal keening had me on edge. Even if I could rationalize it, I lay tangled in my clammy bedding, frozen in fear, listening, feeling, like an intruder waiting to be discovered. The next few days were tough. I felt isolated and inept, both of which were true. I discovered I had bad reception on my phone when I tried to call dad for advice on preparing brick and paint, and the biggest successes I had were clearing branches from the garden and installing a new globe on the back veranda light. Another night, Soon after I heard scratching sounds just outside my window and on the veranda. I thought it was a possum or something, but it sounded bigger, and the scratching was loud and frantic. I swallowed my fear and walked to the glass sliding doors that led into the garden, switching on the light I had installed. I saw a dark shadow move near the house, then bushes at the end of the garden leading into the forest suddenly shake as something crashed through them. It was big, whatever it was, and solid like a hog but with longer legs. It was fast too, lopping on all fours out of sight before I even had the time to process what I was seeing. The next night though, I was ready, and when I heard the scratching again, I all but ran to the light switch but nothing happened. The switch didn't work. I suddenly felt vulnerable and exposed in front of the glass doors, as though any number of lurking creatures I couldn't see outside in the pitch blackness could all see in. I skulked back to bed, laying awake with my basically useless mobile phone still clenched in my hand just in case. All the while, that scratching went on around the house. At one point, it sounded like fingernails on my window. Two things I discovered that morning. There were legitimate scratches on my windowsill, etched deeply, not just through the flecking paintwork, but into the wood and why my outside light didn't work. The globe was gone, completely removed, like unscrewed and taken somewhere. I was getting very scared at this point. I drove into town to go to the hardware store and to get reception to call my dad. I must have sounded crazy in the phone call. I was getting hysterical, and I hadn't actually spoken to another human properly for over a week. I speculated through tears 
that it was my ex messing with my mind. Knowing about the breakup and the financial pressure of trying to get the house ready for resale, he tried to calm me down, told me I just wasn't used to the forest wildlife and that he would take time off work to come and help me in a couple of weeks. It was enough to convince me I was imagining things, get my supplies and groceries and head back home. Things escalated after that. The new light globe I bought was taken the night after I installed it. This time it was shattered on the top step outside my front door, the opposite side of the house, and I cut my bare feet on it the next morning. The plumbing that had been fine up to that point suddenly started spewing forth a foul smelling black muck with the texture of custard out of every faucet. I kept finding dead animals at the back of the garden near the forest. Lizards or snakes, birds, a rat, a possum, and then one day, half of a dog. Just the front half only. Its hindquarters were gone. Insects going to work on the poor animal's eyes and tongue. I dug as deeply as I could and buried it, putting the only flowers I had, some dandelions, on the grave. Another time I left some laundry pegged and drying on the washing line overnight and found it scattered across the garden the next morning. There had been a strong wind, true, but I followed the trail of my clothes blown unfeasibly deep into the forest. Some items I never recovered at all. I didn't search far amongst the trees for my clothes. I felt watched. I felt like I was being left a trail. To what end? I had no idea. Suddenly, the house seemed like a sanctuary, and with the hairs on the back of my neck prickling, I ran back, my arms of what clothes and linen I had recovered, billowing behind me. During the day, I would go into a frenzy of activity, scrubbing, sanding, ripping out the kitchen cupboards and varnishing the floorboards. At night, I was a wreck and barely slept even though I was exhausted. It felt like the backyard was getting shorter and the forest was encroaching closer, the animal noises growing ever louder and always that scratching. Like something was trying to get inside. It was a relief when my dad arrived to stay for so many reasons. Someone with more DIY know-how than me and someone to tell me I wasn't going insane. There has definitely been some kind of animal activity out here, you're right. Something is trying to burrow under the foundations. I've got a surprise for you, he told me, already looking pleased with himself. He had bought electric fence wiring and steel posts, along with a battery energizer. Having grown up on a farm, Dad had done this before for temporary grazing pastures for cattle, and we spent the day setting it up along the existing fence post that ran along the edge of the property, where it met the forest. Smugly, he assured me that the fence would give whatever animal it was the right idea, and we sat on the back veranda with a couple of beers until dusk, discussing our next projects for the house. That night, he set up a sleeping bag on the floor of the living room, the room with the glass doors looking out onto the back veranda, and I went to bed as usual. For the first time in weeks, I fell into a deep sleep. I was woken abruptly, however, just after 2 a.m. by the most horrific, agonized screaming I have ever heard. 
I thought it was my dad at first, and ran into the living area just as he was running into my room, thinking it was me. The noise went on, and we looked out the glass doors, and in the dim moonlight, saw a dark shape on four legs, wrestling with the electric fence wires, like it was trapped in them. The screaming changed, it became less frightened, and took on a breathless, angry grunting. Sparks started spurting from the energizer, and in the erratic glow, we saw the creature raise itself onto its hind legs. I heard my dad mutter, what the hell is that? In no more than a whisper, and the animal instantly froze. It was impossible to tell in the dark, but I swear it was looking straight at us. Not moving, despite the pulsing electric wire still wrapped around it. I was gripping my dad's arms, and we were both still and tense. Whatever it was, in that moment, raised on its hind legs, it looked vaguely human. But the proportions were wrong. Its torso was too broad, its face too long, its legs bent out at strange angles. It raised its head like it was sniffing the air. And then it charged straight at the house, straight at us. The wire snapped like twigs, and you could hear the solid weight of it thudding on the ground as it barreled through the garden towards us. Dad yelled, Car! Over! and over again, and I don't know when he picked up his ute keys, but I'm glad he did. We ran through the front passage, stopping for nothing, leaving the front door swinging on its hinges. As we wrenched open the doors of the ute, there was a sound of shattering glass, and we knew it was in the house. The car was sputtering to life, and Dad was shoving the gear stick into place before I had even closed the passenger door. We hurtled down the driveway. It was a couple of kilometers until the nearest main road. I've always thought of my dad as the epitome of safe driving, but we were going so fast, only headlights for guidance, that I swore we were going to hit one of the trees. I yelled at him to slow down. And all he said to me was, Rear view. I watched in my side mirror and saw nothing at first. The driveway was full of bends designed to slow cars down. On a straight stretch, I saw what Dad had seen. That same dark, hulking form bounding behind us at what seemed like impossible speeds. At the next corner in the road, it disappeared into the bush. It was cutting the corners to keep up with us. My heart was icy. I could have vomited with fear. I'm so grateful my dad was composed enough to focus on getting us out of there. We made it to the main road and in the welcoming glow of the streetlights, there was no sign of pursuit. You're not living there again, my dad told me simply, like I was ever going to disagree. We stayed at a motel for a few nights, met up with an old farming friend of dad's in the area to borrow his rifle, and went and mustered our courage to go back in the daylight. The place was torn to shreds inside. There wasn't a curtain or scrap of carpet untorn. Every window and every mirror had been shattered, and the wooden floorboards had what looked like claw marks scratched deeply into them. The mattress in my bedroom was intact, but soaked in blood, with an unrecognizable rotting animal carcass draped across it. Skin shredded, bones gnawed and decayed rapidly setting in. My dad paid to have a company bulldoze the house for me. 
He told them a pack of wild dogs must have gotten in. I sold the land for a loss and moved back in with my parents. I still feel uneasy when I drive past any sort of bushland, especially at night. Sometimes, over the blare of the radio and the hum of the engine, I even think I can hear that same screaming noise deep within the trees, like it is still following me. I brought myself back to where it happened, so I can relive the events that occurred five years ago. I will try to recall them as accurately as possible. I could feel the same summer breeze on my face. The shade from the tree hides me from the near blinding sunlight. I sit down on the ground and lean myself against the tree on my left. The marks are still there. The tree has seemingly exaggerated them. I run my fingers over the marks, as I do. An all too familiar chill strokes my spine, making me shudder. The floor is brisk with brown, dead leaves from the autumn just past. I pull out a box of cigarettes from my pocket. Place one between my lips and spark up. I stare at the little town of Ware, buried in the valleys, just visible through the tree line. The memory of that night came back clearer than day in that moment. I stubbed my cigarette out in the root of the tree, careful as it not to set any dry leaves alight. I stand up and walk through the overgrowth to the old camping spot. Nature has not been kind to the camping gear that was left behind. Only remnants of the tents were left. They were now merely scraps of fabric heaped on the floor. Smashed chairs spread across the camp. The police investigation barriers were still there, left to the forest, and I'm facing some serious demons just being here. Well, let me provide some contacts with a little back history. Back in early April, a few years ago, a group of friends and I had decided to go camping. There was no particular reason. We figured it would be a good chance to get together and have a few drinks. Well, maybe more than a few cook some cheap meat products and just hang out, as you would do in your youth. The first time we did this, we had an absolute blast. I recall many badly played songs on my old Fender guitar, a ferocious flame for some delicious pork and leek sausage, and times not to be forgotten. After we woke up in very sweaty tents the next morning, we packed our belongings and headed to our homes. On the walk back to our houses, we decided that we should make this a regular thing. And lo and behold, we found ourselves back in the woods the very next weekend. For a few weeks, we kept up the camping trips. Routine drinking, singing, and badly barbecued meat seemed to be the best thing in the world for all of us. Some of my fondest memories come from those camping trips, but things quickly changed. I once heard someone say, life's a bitch and she just don't care. Seems to sum up the next part of the story pretty nicely. D clan. He was the most uplifting member of the group always there for everyone, easily the most charismatic. His American accent made even me swoon. He was living at my friend Alice's at the time. One day, out of nowhere, she received a peculiar 
Facebook message from one of Declan's ex-girlfriends. She claimed not to believe a word he said, that he was a manipulative liar, a sociopath and general asshole. Of course, at the time, we believed nothing of it. Curious though, we looked into it and I won't go into specifics on how we found out, and that's another story in itself, but it turns out she wasn't lying. Upon confronting him, we soon learned he had been faking his accent for three years, using people for homes and money. He stole personality traits from people to manipulate anyone into trusting him. For example, the second time I met him, he divulged into me about his mother's death, and I took sympathy on him as I was in the same situation, but it later came to light his mother was alive and well, and he used that trait against me to seek attention, gain my trust, to feed his sociopathic tendencies. This even split the group in half. People didn't know how to react. He was seeing Mary at the time and she didn't know how to deal with such a thing and none of us did really. We were all so young and naive. We came to the conclusion that Ethan, Regan and I would escort Declan to London so he could stay at Regan's for the night and we could send him back to what was left of his family. However, on the train journey up there. Ethan was getting a little bit too friendly with him. At one point later that day, Ethan asked me and Regan to apologize to the clan for things we said to him, and we laughed in his face. That evening, myself and Ethan got into a huge argument. We blew up at each other, like the impact of kinetic bombardment. We didn't fight, but opinions were expressed and secrets came out feelings were exposed, all at high volume in close quarters. I imagine anyone who heard or saw us would be akin to an innocent child hearing their mom and dad fight for the first time. I was living with Ethan at the time and this wasn't the first time he had royally pissed me off, so I left London as quick as I could. After we had dealt with the clan. I went back to where I was living with Ethan, packed as much as my stuff as I could cram into a car, and left for my fiance's flat. I sunk into a pit of depression over this. I knew it was a rash decision, leaving behind my life like that. But I felt as if I couldn't be near him. Luckily, I didn't have a job at the time, so I just continued my hunt in Cambridge where I now resided. As luck would have it, the first job agency I walked into offered me what seemed like my dream job. It turns out, it was. I was a photo editor. I mean, only graduation and school photos, but hell, I was being paid a generous wage to listen to music and fine-tune photos. Nothing could be easier. I found a place to live, local to the job and quite cheap and things were going fantastic for a change. Then came that fucking Friday. I left work on top of the world. I had made some great friends and drinking buddies at work. My boss was impressed that I was hitting my quota. I had money to spare. I felt so good I went to get a haircut for a summer ball that was coming up. I left the hairdressers and headed home. As usual, my landlady didn't answer the buzzer, but the door was open so I went upstairs, where I proceeded to spend the next hour and a half pounding at the door only to have my landlady's boyfriend open the door. Looking anxious and dripping with sweat, I asked him to speak to my landlady, and he yelled at me. Suspicious of what was going on. I packed some clothes and planned to stay at my fiance's that night. On my way out, I noticed the bathroom door had been kicked, you know, based on the damage, from the hinges. 
jumping to the worst conclusion, as I always do. I panicked and called the police to report a domestic abuse. My allegations later turned out to be correct. I later returned to the property and was hastily threatened by the boyfriend, who then in turn held me hostage It made me pack everything of value I owned to sell and pay him for the goods the police apparently took for evidence. Luckily, this guy was a fucking moron. He went into the front room and fell asleep, and this gave me the opportunity to run. I ran out of the building like it was falling down. I lost nearly everything I owned that day. My home, my job, a lot of money, and the majority of my possessions. I spent the next week wearing the same outfit due to my lack of clothing. I found myself back in the pit of depression, and this time it seemed there was no way out. I sat around watching and re-watching the small movie collection my fiancé had, until I received a phone call from my parents. They turned up, seemingly out of the blue, with about 70% of my things. I don't know how they managed to get into the flat and get my stuff back. Well, what wasn't sold off. And I'm not sure I want to know. Being the social recluse I currently was, I was happy to see my PC in the pile of things they had secured. I went straight in it and set it up. First thing I did was log on to Facebook. I had a fair few notifications, the usual Tosh, so and so has liked your photo, messages asking me where I'd gone. But there was something that actually caught and held my attention. My good friend Catherine had put up a Facebook event hosting another camping trip. I jumped at the opportunity to get away from everything. It was perfect. I'd get to see all my friends get stupidly drunk, but most of all, escape from the real world for an entire weekend. Clear my mind and think about nothing but having fun. I accepted the invitation and waited. I arrived two days prior to the trip, so had plenty of time to kill. I met my friend Howard on the train and we headed off to meet Alice, the most promiscuous member of the group, Jenna, our resident goth who had recently dreadlocked her hair, Ben, the meth head, and boy do I have some stories about this guy. Then there was Matt, the small and bubbly, mouse-like one. This was just a small portion of the usual group, but most of them were busy. Britain was suffering one of the worst heat waves I'd ever lived through, so the skate park was off limit as was the park. Open, sunlit areas were far too much for us to handle. We eventually came up with the idea of going swimming. Since the local pool was closed, and we had no costumes, we headed down to Angel Lake, the Anglers Club Lake just on the outskirts of where. We took the long stroll down there and made no haste in stripping down to our underwear and diving straight in. Howard, Ben, Matt, and I were all a little skeptical about who should go first. A quick game of rock, paper, scissors tidied that up. Ben went first in what was quite the majestic dive. I was second. I went with the slightly easier cannonball. Howard followed with a casual jump, and Matt dove in last, yelling some song lyric that now escapes my memory. The ladies, on the other hand, were far more skeptical and changed their minds. I recall Jenna not wanting to ruin her new dreads, and Alice was just far too self-conscious to join us, however. In our childish nature, and an attempt to gloat manliness to the ladies, we decided to have a race out to a small island in the middle of the lake. Angel Lake was pretty sizable. 
It would take a decent swimmer around 20 minutes to swim just one length, at a guess. It's surrounded by a line of trees the whole way around, with several openings for fishermen. The four of us set off, stroking as fast as we could. I'm pretty unfit. I weighed about 12 and a half stone at the time, which, for my height, is classified as overweight. Not to mention that I smoke like a chimney. So, as you can imagine, I struggled to swim very fast, but I made it over nevertheless. Howard, as usual, he won. He had a habit of taking friendly competitions a little too seriously, and Ben soon followed him, then Matt, and of course me lagging behind in last place. I dragged myself up the muddy ledge of the little island. Though only a small patch of land, the overgrowth was immense. I found it almost impossible to wade through five feet of it to get to the lonely tree that had grown. Towering above the body of water, Ben, on the other hand, had no trouble at all. He always jumped into situations head on. No matter how big or small, he just dived straight in. He had already climbed to a stable bit of tree before I had the chance to climb up. Looking around, taking in the surroundings, I felt at home again. I felt at peace with the recent events that had unfolded in my life. I could really appreciate what I was looking at and the friends I was with. I took careful note of everything so I could really try to remember this feeling in the future when life would get me down. The scene was so beautiful. The vibrant shades of green among the trees and plants around the lake. The vast, open, clear sky with no clouds to be seen. The murky brown water we were swimming in. The sounds of the birds chirping away without a care. The echoes of a nearby motorway and trains horns in the distance. The people sat further up the lake having a barbecue. I'll tell you something, the smell of that barbecue was tantalizing, like nothing I'd ever smelt before. Clearly, they were talented cooks. I was half tempted to swim over and ask them for some. I remember the soil beneath my feet and wading through the patches of overgrown grass. Everything is still so clear in my head of that day. And this is where my story takes a darker turn. While Ben was sitting up in the tree, I took it upon myself to find a good climbing point. As I said, I wasn't the athletic type, so climbing was pretty difficult. I walked around the tree inspecting the branches, judging how strong they would be with my weight pulling on them. That's where I felt a soft patch of soil between my toes, and it struck me as odd, due to the island's overgrowth of weeds, that there would be a soft patch of soil. Investigation was imminent. I bent down to feel the patch. Then I started pulling the soil apart, digging at it to see if something had been buried. Christ almighty and fuck I wish I hadn't. I can't speak for anyone else in the world, but if you ever have come across the skull with some rotting flesh still stuck to it and an eyeball just hanging there, you'll know what I'm on about when I say that you just can't even react to such a sight. There was no such adjective that can quite describe it. I mean, you find a skull, and you can assume it's from years ago, but finding something as fresh as that, skin, still attached in places, 
a single eye, dead, but ever staring. It's not a feeling I can quite put into words. Not even the ecosystem had taken its course yet, as no maggots were tucking in like you'd expect. Wherever this came from, it was recent, very recent. So many people go missing every day, and often they never turn back up. Most just don't want to be found, some are taken, some find themselves in unfortunate accidents. The rest, however, are usually murdered, taken in cold blood. I had the unfortunate circumstance of stumbling across that of a murder victim. At least, I could only assume so. No accident would cause what I found. I thought about digging deeper for only a brief moment when my stomach had other ideas. Most people would undoubtedly scream at this point. It wouldn't be unfair reaction in all honesty, but no, I just kind of stopped for a minute. I turned white as a ghost apparently. At this point Howard and Ben were shouting at me. I seemed to have tuned out of reality. When the guys saw why, there was this unspoken mutual understanding. Eventually, someone spoke. I honestly don't remember who, and they just mumbled something about getting back over to shore and calling the authorities. We recomposed ourselves, took deep breaths, and swam back to shore. We explained to the girls what we found and they had their skepticisms, can't blame them, not the kind of thing you believe without seeing. They were soon in the mindset that we were dead serious when we phoned the police. About 20 minutes after I placed the phone call, they showed up. There was quite a few officers there, CSI style coppers were there too, as to be expected. They had to wait for someone to bring out a boat for the police. I was the only person who stayed, though admittedly not through my own choice. Everyone else had to head home as it was getting late, and I told Howard that I'd catch up with him later. The CSI crew rode over to the island, and I just sat watching, anticipating the worst. An officer tried to comfort me, but I was zoned out, focusing on watching the CSI people digging up that small island. From what I could make out, there was indeed an entire body buried there. Being quite far away, I couldn't tell if the body was in the same state as the skull, but I can only assume it was. The police took me back to the station as they wanted a statement from me. Due to the fact that I had witnesses and an alibi, there was no need to question me, so the process was relatively quick. Around 40 minutes, they offered to give me a ride home, but Howard only lived a short distance from the police station, so I declined and walked back. I needed the fresh air and I was still feeling just nauseous. I went over to Howard's and we both just kind of sat in silence. Not the awkward silence after an argument, more like that mutual understanding that what we just seen was pretty fucked up. We needed something to take our minds off of it, so I headed to the shop over the road and picked up a crate of cheap beer and we got drunk and watched Doctor Who. We both enjoyed drinking and Doctor Who a lot, and in all fairness, it helped a lot. It was almost uh, therapeutic. The next day kind of blurred past me. I don't recall much of it, just minor things. I woke up early the next morning. Despite my hungover state, the memory of the day before came flooding back. I went over to my friend Alice's for a few rounds of COD. She brought up what had happened, just really asking how I felt. I had trouble responding, 
I don't know how you're supposed to feel about something like that. I felt null and void, unable to pull an emotion out of my head. That's the easiest way to explain it, though it doesn't make much sense. We headed into town and met up with a few people. Not anyone I particularly cared about, just people who were sometimes there when I hung out with my social group. We just wasted the day away, trying to avoid the heat. I was just waiting for the next day to come, when I could camp with everyone again, thinking that would make me forget all about what had happened. The day of the trip was finally upon us, and it was yet another blistering heat wave kind of day. But that never bothered me, I just wanted to get going. Howard and I packed up our sleeping bags and camping gear and headed on down to the agreed meeting point, the back of Tesco's in town. We were there a little early because Howard only lived a couple of minutes walk away, but people started showing up. After about 30 minutes, everyone was there, including myself, there were 13 of us. So we popped into the Tesco's and picked up the alcohol, barbecue supplies, fire lighters, and that sort of stuff. And then we started walking, that long walk to the woods. My dearest friends were with me. Howard, who I've mentioned a bit, he was the rocker of the group. He had this awesome mohawk, usually dressed in a denim jacket with ripped off sleeves with a band shirt and jean. He was a bass player as well. He was just an awesome dude. Catherine, who organized the event, was this stick insect-esque girl. Uh, long blonde hair, she easily got upset by a lot of things. That was her go-to guy when she was upset. I spent a lot of time comforting her. Even Ethan was coming along, my old alternative friend. He had since dyed his hair this teal color. I had to hand it to him. It actually looked really good. The style hadn't changed much. He shared Henry's denim jacket with ripped sleeves and band shirt, but favored the skinny jean. He literally never wore anything else. It took us around 45 minutes to walk there, partially due to the heat exhausting us immensely. We also hated walking long distances, but nevertheless, we made it to the bottom of Postwood Road. The quickest and easiest way into the woods. Since we'd all done it before a fair few times, we knew our way to where we always camped. It was the perfect spot just far enough from anywhere that we could. We were secluded, but close enough to not get lost. It was a huge flat ground with fallen trees in just the right way to act as seats, a hole we dug for our campfire and enough space to spread the tents out perfectly. After an hour of fumbling around with tents, just about getting them set up right, we cracked open the beers and headed out to collect kindling and fire logs for the campfire. It being the woods, of course, there was plenty to be gathered. We split into groups and headed into different directions, whilst one group stayed behind. Being the lazy procrastinator that I am, I was one of the people who stayed behind along with Ethan and Jenna. We sat and reminisced on memories on previous camping trips. The day we used to hang around town, skating and going to the pub. All the stuff I missed the most. The kind of stuff I needed to take my mind off of what I'd seen. Strange, really. I felt pretty fucked up, but despite just two days previous not being able to comprehend what emotion I was feeling, I was now able to just glance over the whole situation as if it were something in a video game or book I'd read. I really tried not to dwell on it, as I just wanted to enjoy the night ahead. Despite my shaky history with Ethan, we were getting on swimmingly. I think an argument was what we needed, as well as the time apart. 
We joked about how we were like a couple, and to be quite honest, we kind of were. Ethan was one of my best friends, and we got along so well, well, most of the time. We had minor falling outs, but we were over them in a matter of minutes usually. He was a good guy at heart, he never had any bad intentions. I think we just built up a lot of tension and everything that went down with the clan cracked us to the core and we snapped, like a pair of hounds going at each other. We sat there, talking and laughing. I noticed somebody moving around behind a cluster or overgrowth of trees. It was Barry. He had brought back enough firewood to last us a week. He always did go over the top with things like that. He cracked straight on us with building the fire. I asked if he wanted help, but he wasn't interested. He loved camping. More traditional style camping, not the kids getting drunk in the woods kind of. So he did all the hard work himself and it suited us. We could drink more while he did the hard stuff. Something else I noticed was that barbecue smell again. The exact same one from the lake the other day. Given that this was a public park or forest, I wasn't surprised. But I couldn't help but take in the delicious, luscious scent. I really craved whatever it was those people were having. It was unlike any food I'd ever smelt. I questioned myself what it must have been. There must be new butchers in town, maybe. Or some new food craze. Either way, I wanted some. I asked Ethan and Jenna about it, and they told me they could smell it, but they didn't know what it was either. They said it smelled funny, though. Anyway, they were vegetarian, so I guess I can't expect them to enjoy whatever it was. Everyone else eventually made their way back to our spot, and we sat around the fire. Cliché warning. We pulled out the guitar. We started singing stuff, and nobody could really remember the words to, except Wonderwall. Yeah, yeah, I know, Oasis. But hey, we enjoyed it. Nightfall came, and being the connoisseur of spooky stories that I am, I thought that I'd try my hand at telling the group some stories that sent chills down my spine. I remember that I read this brilliant short tale with an amazing twist that spooked me a lot. So, paraphrasing a lot, I told the group the story. Most of the group was pretty much meh about it, but two of the girls, Catherine and Mary, were absolutely terrified. I actually felt quite bad for scaring them, so I broke the story down into why it couldn't logically happen. That seemed to help them a little bit, but not an awful lot. The moon seemed to be at its peak when somebody said they could hear noises coming from around us. Everyone laughed and just joked about trying them to scare people, and that it was a pathetic attempt. In truth, it was pretty piss poor. They were adamant enough to make myself and Ethan go look though, so I'll give them that. We grabbed a torch each and headed out together. We reconnected properly whilst we were walking. We hadn't spoken like this in ages. A moment of real talk, just two friends understanding each other on a deep level. It was great to be back talking to him again. Needless to say, though we were distracted, we didn't find anything more than a couple of foxes roaming the perimeter. We looked around a little longer, just to make the guys think we did a wide search. When we got back, we informed everyone that there was nothing to be afraid of. Was obvious to most, all but the person who spoke up about it in the first place. We sat down with everyone else, and I noticed that someone was missing. I asked everyone, and nobody had noticed that Mary was missing. We started to panic a little bit, worrying where she had got to, 
and wondered why no one had noticed she had left until someone opened the tent and saw that she had passed out drunk in there. We all laughed about it. We started to get hungry, so I whipped out a pack of sausages I brought along and grabbed some sticks to put the sausages on. A good old-fashioned flame-cooked sausage. Delicious. Though not as delicious as that meat smelt. My word, I was having serious cravings for some of that. I asked the group about it. And they all thought it was a little strange me asking after an unknown smell. But to be honest, we were pretty drunk at this point, so we all shrugged it off. I really did want some of that meat. As the night went on, we swapped stories, drank some more, ate some more, and we all left to sleep one by one. It got to the point where it was just Ethan and me again. I was getting really tired and the drunken state was wearing off and I could feel a headache coming on, so I decided it was time for me to drop off. We both headed to our tents and said goodnight. I climbed into my tent and got cozied up under my duvet. I didn't bring a sleeping bag cause they never heat me up, unlike my amazing duvet. I let my mind wander as most do as they drift off into the land of dreams. I could just about make out the morning sun coming up through my thin tent walls. I was having trouble drifting off. I could never sleep when I could see daylight. As I was staring out at the ever so slightly light getting brighter, I could make out a silhouette. I followed its movements. It seemed to walk around the campsite. I figured it was Ethan looking for the toilet trench. I was getting drowsy, so I tried not to pay attention anymore and to get some sleep. Then I could hear murmurs, whispers in the wind. I was internally struggling with deciding to get up and help him out or stay in bed and try to sleep. When I saw another silhouette, I decided to get out and help him. To my surprise, it was not Ethan. It was a peculiarly dressed fellow. He had one of those see-through splatter suits, like the one from American Psycho. Underneath, he was dressed in a red suit, white shirt, and red tie combo. It fucking freaked me out. But I managed to hold my wits and asked him if I could help. He just smiled and pulled out a knife. Next thing I knew, I was on the floor, face pouring with blood and a horrid sting and the realization that this freak of nature just slashed my face open. I yelled out for everyone and they awoke startled. As everyone slowly climbed out of their tents, more of these people, all dressed the same way as the freak that slashed me, came running to where we were. They came from every direction, swiftly and silently. Nobody, including myself, knew how to react. We tried to fight them, but there were so many of them. They just seemed to bleed out of the woods from behind the trees. They all had similar weapons, all knives of some variety. They were dragging us out of the tents and tying us to the trees. At this point, I was certain someone there had brought drugs with them and spiked my drink, and I was on some really bad trip. Sadly though, that wasn't the reality. The reality was... We were all being tied to trees for God knows what. Murder, I assumed. This is where my life ends. I was sure of it. As I was being tied to a tree opposite Ethan, I started crying, but not sobbing. The silent cry. Tears were rolling down my face. 
as I was coming to terms with the situation. My friends and I were about to be murdered. The guy who slashed my face, the leader of the group I assumed, walked up to me. He didn't talk, nor make a sound. None of the red-suited people did. He got right up in my face and inhaled. Started sniffing my neck, my arms, most of my body parts. I screamed in his face asking what the fuck he was doing, but his smile just grew, becoming more malicious. Everyone at this point was crying or screaming, but no one came. I knew it was early in the morning, but nobody came. Not an early morning dog walker or other campers. This part of my story is going to be the worst. I worked out pretty shortly after the freaks had finished sniffing everyone and took what they look like a blood sample from all of us. The leader, or whatever fucked up cult this was, stood in the middle of everyone, though still a little dazed from what was going on. I could hear clearly what he said. The words, though simple, send a horrific shiver down my spine. Commence the harvest. The cult members walked off for a moment and came back with medical coolers. You know, the kind they have on an accident scene to save any working organs to keep them fresh. Now was the point I started to freak out. By harvest, what he meant was tearing me and my friends to pieces for some kind of cannibalistic wet dream. I could do nothing but watch as Ethan, one of my best friends, was sliced up and tortured in front of me as one of the cult filleted his skin and muscle, pulling his organs out one by one, careful as not to damage anything upon removal. I watched the life leave his eyes as his screams were cut off abruptly. I could hear the others going through the same pain, a wild mesh of screams and seemingly endless torture. I had to close my eyes. My time was coming soon. I couldn't take the sights of blood and murder anymore. I wanted to pass out. The process they went through was surprisingly quick. That's about the only eligible thought I could make. After brutally butchering nine of us, they stopped, their suits covered in blood, almost as if they were dyed with it. I suppose that's why they wore red suits, to keep the blood hidden when performing this monstrous procedure. The members of this cult formed a circle, and the leader walked into the middle of the circle, and he simply asked, have we collected enough? And they replied, yes, in perfect unison. Four of us left alive. Barry begged them to kill him. I don't think he could live with what he just witnessed, and I can't blame him. They simply ignored him, and myself and the other two they decided weren't fit for their harvest. I don't know to this day why I was released, nor why any of the four of us were freed. I literally cannot comprehend a logical analysis of what happened or why. They injected us with some kind of sleeping drug and untied us. I collapsed as soon as I was untied. The last thing I remember seeing was Barry trying to chase after the people, but collapse in a similar manner to the rest of us. It was effortless. They had slaughtered a group of kids, and none of us were older than twenty. And for what? A sick, twisted harvest of human meat. The four of us awoke seemingly simultaneously. 
an elderly couple walking their dog had found us just hours later. They asked us what had happened and why we were out here, and before I could speak, I looked around. There was no trace of blood or any evidence that they were here. How the fuck does someone manage that? A brutal slaughter and no traces left behind. These people were skilled in their art of murder. I thought for just a moment that they were perhaps behind the skull that I'd found. But that would be too coincidental. So I brushed that thought off and stood up to talk to the elderly couple. Before I could say anything, one of the other two said we were on a drunken, drug-fueled night and that they shouldn't bother themselves with us. They looked disgusted and muttered something about respecting public places and morals and the usual tosh people rant about when they think they're better than you. At first, I was confused at why he said that, but then it hit me that to tell someone we were attacked by a crazy cult might seem like we were on a drug-fueled night, especially with the lack of evidence. So really, he did us a favor. Barry and the other guy stayed quiet as the couple walked away. We didn't even bother to grab our stuff, we just got up and walked, and we walked, and we walked. We didn't really go anywhere, we just all followed each other eventually making our way into town. I didn't even realize my face was still sliced open until the fresh air hit my opened wound. There must have been some kind of anesthesia in the sleeping drugs we were given. I decided I was going to go to the hospital to get it checked and phoned an ambulance for myself. I didn't say goodbye to the others. I couldn't bring myself to. I let them walk on, wandering aimlessly. The ambulance crew arrived and asked me what happened. I lied to them and simply told them that I took a heavy dosage of an unknown drug and woke up like this. They seemed to buy that. They took me to the hospital and stitched me up, but not long before taking samples of my blood for testing. They kept me in overnight while they awaited the results. I woke up the next morning to a nurse bringing me some water. She explained to me that the blood results came back negative for common drugs and asked me if I was lying. I looked her dead in the eye and told her I wasn't. I told her I had no real recollection of what happened for most of the weekend. And she believed me, though I think she herself was lying, and she asked if I was willing to give consent to be watched for the 72 hours under a psychiatric doctor. I was not willing to do so. One year prior to the events of Postwoods, I had receded into isolation. I got a job working as a night staff in a supermarket. I left my fiance. Lost contact with all family and friends. Moved into a single bed sit. I became that weird guy, you see. You know, yeah, you know the one. The one who everyone laughs at for being a Larry loner. I understood, though. Why people became like that. Became an outcast. It was a choice not a personal trait. It helped though, disconnecting myself from reality, from people. I learned to stop caring, and caring just hurt too much. No one ever found out about what happened, not the truth at least. The police instigated an investigation into the disappearance of nine teens in one night, but I was never approached by them. I wasn't in hiding or anything, they just never contacted me. After two years, the investigation was shut down. I followed the case closely. You might be wondering why I didn't step forward 
and the simple, selfish answer is that I didn't want to. I was better off left in my pit. Besides, I'd become key suspect and get thrown in jail. I wanted isolation, but not that kind. Living with the knowledge and memories of what had happened, having to experience it firsthand was prison sentence enough. I withered away at my PC day after day, going from intense research into tribes and cults, looking for an explanation into what happened, some kind of closure at the very least, to wasting nights away on YouTube and Reddit to keep in track of the police investigations. I'd look at every article I could find, pick up any paper that made minute references to it. That was until today. As I said, I followed that case closely, but my efforts were in vain, as three and a half years of constant research produced little to no results. Whoever these people were, they kept to themselves, hidden on a military level. I was ready to finally give up and let go, until I got an email. Harvest. I was looking into this people, and they were looking into me. Which leads me to where I am now. I was not entirely truthful when I said I was here to recollect. That was to merely catch your attention. I apologize for bringing you this far under false pretenses. I am here to investigate whoever sent that email. Cryptic though it may be, it's fairly simple to work out. They want to meet me here. It couldn't mean anything else. My initial thought is that it was one of the other two that went off the radar. So, as I'm writing, I still see no trace of anyone coming and it's nightfall. I will wait all night if I have to. Well, things didn't go the way I expected. I had started to nod off when two people approached me. It may have been a few years, but they were a couple of faces I would never forget. They were the two who were let go alongside me and Barry. They approached me with a bag and left. I tried to follow them, but I wasn't too sure I wanted to. I was a little hazed and overwhelmed with thought. I just sat back down on the floor and stared at the bag. I picked up the bag. It was a neat looking thing, as if it had never been used. It was a dark maroon color with brown seams and zips. It wasn't very heavy, certainly nothing I would struggle to take home, which was my next action. I arrived back to my dingy bedsit and I opened the bag. And the bag contained an all too familiar red suit, white shirt, and red tie. I searched the pockets and found an address. Also contained in the bag was a slab of tightly vacuum packed meat. It wasn't anything I'd seen before. I don't know if it was the combination of events and a simple random thought, but it occurred to me to cook the meat contained in this bag. And almost as soon as I slapped that meat on my grill, a sickly sweet memory of that beautiful meat came flying back overwhelming me. I had to take a moment to contain myself. I recomposed myself and went to go take a look at that address. A quick Google map search showed that it wasn't far. I couldn't only take a guess at what this meant. I think it was an invitation to the cult. 
I guess. I mean, I guess I have nothing else in life. And that meat. Oh, that sweet, juicy meat. I was about 12 years old when my parents sent me to that shithole. They were so determined to get me to camp. Not just that camp, but really any camp. I took it as code for, we'll be at work all week and we don't trust you alone. My parents showed me the brochure and it actually looked kind of fun. The picture on the front of the brochure had slides, activities, and really anything that a 12 year old kid would want in a camp. It was pretty legit. The kids all seemed to be having fun in the picture, so I kowtowed to the idea and eventually gave in. I remember it like it was yesterday. Camp Omega in the foothills, Virginia, in some small town. It was like any other camp. Bunks to sleep in, campfires at night, and friendly counselors. Looking back on it, maybe too friendly. At the time, I thought they were just being friendly because it was their job. I've never been so wrong. Camp was fun at first. Though the activities were a bit odd. We had to make these dolls that looked like us. Mine had straw for hair and blue button eyes. Then we had to make these bracelets with our names on them. Everything was personalized, which I expected from camp. We had campfires and shared our feelings until we knew each other pretty well. There were about 25 other campers and 15 counselors. One camper stood out to me. Her name was Jeanette. She was nice and didn't talk too much. I was shy too, so we connected easily through enjoying the silence. It was the last day of the week-long camp. I was so happy to be going home the next day. Camp was fun, but I missed home. We sat at the fire with everyone, including the counselors. I wasn't sure if it was the fire, but they looked different. They looked familiar, but their faces were pale as ghosts. I shrugged it off and listened to the next activity, though I wish I didn't. We all had our dolls that resembled us. I held mine in my hand and tried not to look at it, as its blank blue button eyes stared into me. This represents the old you. The you before camp, the lead counselor said to all of us. Then they had us throw the dolls into the fire. I watched as mine was engulfed in flames, snapping and popping as the fire consumed its canvas skin. You are a new person now, the head counselor told us. After the doll burning, they told us there would be a goodbye ceremony and dinner. Two of the counselors led us back to the cabins and told us to pack our stuff. They explained that the celebration ceremony was at the nearby barn on the edge of the property. The other counselor left, so it was just one with us. His name was Scott. He was always nice and had good jokes. He waited at the fire pit as we all gathered our things. He was acting weird as I sat next to him waiting on everyone else. He was staring into the fire silently with a disturbed look on his face. I love you, he muttered once we were all assembled. I didn't know whom he was talking to so I assume I misheard him. I love you guys and I'd do anything for you, he said clearly so we all heard it. We all looked at each other with confused expressions, but it was a nice gesture and we said that we loved him too. He smiled and got up. We're ready, he stated and led us through the forest to the edge of the camp. It was dark and the air got thicker. I was excited for the ceremony. I was ready to leave and go home where there was cable and internet. I had enough of the outdoors to be honest with you. We suddenly exited the woods and the barn loomed in the darkness. All the camp counselors stood around in a circle with torches in hand. I felt my stomach drop. I knew something wasn't right as they ushered us all into the barn. It was an old rickety structure. I'm sure it wasn't up to any building code and I was also pretty sure we shouldn't be in there. The counselors stepped inside and formed a circle around us, closing the door behind them. The head counselor broke from the circle and stood before us. Jeanette Lewinsky? Please come forward for your departure, she said. 
We all looked uneasy, but Jeanette stepped forward. I was happy for her. Maybe she would get a ribbon or something cool to take home. The counselors moved from the ring around the barn to a ring around us, all the while holding their torches. I could feel my heartbeat quicken as they came closer and closer and stabbed Jeanette in the neck. She didn't scream and suddenly it was sudden pandemonium as the counselors threw their torches at the walls of the barn. I didn't notice that all the counselors had long serrated knives with them. I tried to run but the barn was starting to go up like a match. Kids were running around screaming before being stabbed by the counselors. We have to get out of here! I screamed before running straight into Scott. Carl, don't you want to stay for the ceremony? He asked me. His eyes seemed to appear pitch black and he wore the most sadistic smile on his face. I punched him in the gut and ran past him out of the opening in the barn. I had never run that fast in my life. I looked back briefly. God, I wish I never looked behind me. I could see black figures silhouetted by the light of the fire running and screaming. Some stood still with their arms out accepting the stabs by the counselors. I heard chanting of some sort. At first, I couldn't make it out, but it grew louder. We know what's best for you. We love you. Over and over again, the sight of Jeanette's last breath as her mouth filled with blood flashed through my mind and I ran. I ran into the forest, my heart beating in my ears like a drum. I didn't know where the fuck I was going. I was just running in a direction that we came from. The chanting followed me. We know, we know what's, what's best, best for, you. for you. We love, we love you. you. It repeated like a broken record over and over. The glow of the inferno lit the properly dimly, so I was able to come out the other side where the cabins were. I looked behind me again. I could see the brush moving and the chanting growing louder. How did they find me? How did they follow me? We know what's best for you. We love you. I ran faster, but I felt a hand tug at my shirt. I fell and it fell with me. I looked back to see the counselor. He had my ankle in one hand and a knife in the other. His eyes were empty black pits and his skin was white as a sheet. I screamed and kicked the knife out of his hand with my other foot. That loosened his grip a bit and gave me time to get back to my feet and run towards the exit. The sign reading Camp Omega stood hauntingly above the entrance. I ran straight through it. The footsteps behind me stopped as the counselors did. I looked behind again, and there they stood. Looking trapped inside of the campground stood all the counselors, still as a stone, as if they couldn't cross the gate. It started to rain, and that's when they put their hoods up. I didn't even notice the hoods and robes before. Even in the dim light, I could tell they were all blood red. We know what's best for you. We love you. They chanted again. I started to back away slowly, my eyes wide in terror as they pulled their daggers out again. I thought they were going to throw them at me. Part of me wanted to run and scream, but the other was transfixed on the scene playing out in front of me. In unison, they raised their blood-stained knives and stabbed themselves in the necks. Blood spurted everywhere. I could see it mix with the rain as it flowed down their necks and they fell. All I could do was scream and run down the dirt path into the little town. It felt like weeks that I ran until I found the town and the police station. Relief washed over me as I entered the wooden doors. I must have looked like a mess. My hair was matted with a mixture of sweat and rain. I probably had blood on my hands. I looked down at them. They were clean. The rain must have washed off the blood. I walked to the front desk as calmly as I could where the secretary looked at me. She had a shocked expression on her face as if I had just risen from the dead. I assumed it was because of my disheveled appearance. I explained everything to her, the camp, the counselors, what they did, everything. They looked shocked and gave me a glass of water. Do you want to call your parents, Carl? She asked me. Yes, please. She gave me her phone and I called them up. I'm surprised they could understand me since I was choking on my own tears and snot that ran down my face and into an accumulation into my mouth. They came as quickly as they could to pick me up. An hour later, they arrived at the police station. I was so relieved that they found me that once I got into the car, I closed my eyes and I felt safe. 
I must have fallen asleep because when I opened my eyes, we were in an unfamiliar place. I blinked a few times. We were parked in front of a brick building that loomed gloomily overhead. It was then that I realized something. The woman at the police station. How did she know my name? I never told her. Where are we? I asked with apprehension. My parents looked back at me with sad expressions. Son, we're at a mental institution. We're worried about you. My father stated flatly. My jaw fell open. You don't believe me? I asked. Carl, you've been missing for a week now. You showed up at a police station in this small town ranting about some camp with murderous counselors. My mom stated. I was silent, trying to process everything. Carl, we know, we know what's, what's best, best for, you. for you. We love, love you. you. They chanted in unison.